All right, guys, all the recent talk about protein restriction. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can watch my video uh, called The Emergence Diet, or you can watch the video called I Should Restrict Protein, or you can head over to Reddit at r slash saturated fat and jump into that discussion where a lot of people are doing branch chain amino acid restricted diets. But that got me thinking. I've been doing a lot of starch. I like starch. My most recent article over at fireinabottle.net is called What Did We Eat? And I look at the historical evidence for diets in America going back to the 20s. And I show that starch has been declining since then. And so the question I want to get at in this is, is starch ancestral? This gets talked a lot about in the nutrition space. And so this paper was published in 2021. Uh, this is a PopSci article about that. A paper called Neanderthals Carb Loaded, Helping Grow Their Big Brains. And it says DNA from mouth bacteria suggests human ancestors ate diets rich in starchy plants by 600,000 years ago. Now here is that paper. It says we analyzed 124 dental biofilm metagenomes from humans, including Neanderthals and late Pleistocene to present day modern humans, chimpanzees, and gorillas, as well as New World howler monkeys for comparison, we find that a core microbiome of primarily biofilm structural taxa has been maintained throughout African hominid evolution. And these microbial groups are also shared with howler monkeys, suggesting that they have important oral members since before the caterine platterine split. That means that monkeys in South America have the same bacteria living on their teeth as monkeys in Africa, right? And they showed that the microbial profiles of both Neanderthals and modern humans are highly similar. And these include an apparent homo specific, so homo Neanderthal and homo sapien. These include an apparent homo specific acquisition of salivary amylase binding capability by oral streptococci. And so bacteria don't all have the ability to break down starch. And so these oral streptococci, they live in our mouth. And what they've done is they made their own protein that can actually catch our the salivary amylase. So amylase is a gene that breaks down starch. It's in our saliva, as the name would suggest. And these bacteria developed a way to actually capture that enzyme from our saliva and use that enzyme themselves to break down some of the starch that we eat that they obviously would also have access to. So it's a pretty clever adaptation. They go on to say these streptococcus groups, and that's the enzyme that they have that catches the salivary amylase, are a general feature of HOMO, suggesting that starch-rich foods, possibly modified by cooking, first became important early in HOMO evolution prior to the split between Neanderthal and modern human lineages more than 600,000 years ago, a finding with potential implications for the energetics of homo associated encephalization, that means brain growth, subsequent copy number expansion of AME1, which is the amylase gene in question in the modern human genome, and the rise of uh, the oral streptococci may signal an even greater reliance on starch rich foods by modern humans. What happened in humans is, and this has happened in other species, is we have a gene duplication of AME1 which encodes the salivary amylase. And so we make a lot more salivary amylase than a lot of other species because we have a bunch of copies of the gene. And so then Miki Bendor and Raphael Sartoli and Ron Barca uh, responded to this uh, human by, in, by saying human oral microbiome cannot predict pleistocene starch dietary level and dietary glucose consumption is not essential for brain growth. And they say a switch from fruit sourced sucrose to starch consumption must have started seven, seven to five million years ago with hominins appearance. So they don't dispute the idea that between seven and five million years ago, early hominins were consuming starch. And they say regarding their claim for the obligatory association of high starch with brain expansion, we will mention that circumpolar native groups have been living for generations with large brains on a negligible supply of carbohydrates. Uh, they're talking about people like the Inuit. That's a pretty good point. And so then the original authors fire back. Bendor et al. are using unrelated arguments about the archaeological visibility of scavenging and human capacity for gluconeogenesis to promote an extreme vision of early homo diets as carnivorous. Such arguments are largely theoretical and hypothetical and do not seriously engage with the microbial evidence presented in our study. Specifically, we do not make quantitative claims about the frequency 
or amount of starch consumed during early homo evolution, nor do we assert that starch alone was responsible for encephalization. Now, this is a complicated story. I don't know who's correct. I think the bacterial evidence is appealing. Is it possible that Neanderthals were using significant amount of starch before the salivary amylase gene duplication? I believe that it is. My real feeling about this debate is, does it matter? How ancestral is starch really? Uh, where does starch come from? Well, we know this, right? It comes from tubers, you know, potatoes. It comes from seeds, uh, things like chestnuts, also from grains, as you know, wheat, corn, and it comes from fruit, things like unripe plantains. And so I wanna put this debate into some kind of a time framework. This is the evolution of animals. If we go back here, to uh, 750 million years ago, uh, this, these are sponges. So the first animals evolved roughly three quarters of a billion years ago. These dates are approximate, but it's easy to remember because it's three quarters of a billion years ago, you have the first animals, sponges. Then half a billion years ago, you have the first chordates. So what's a chordate? A chordate is a thing with a notochord. The notochord essentially evolved into the spine. Chordates are essentially things with spines, including these lancelets in the photo. And so we evolved from something very much like a lancelet. This species is called Amphioxus. Amphioxus is our great, 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 great grandmother. And so they evolved around 500 million years ago. And then if we move to a quarter billion years ago, that's where the chordates ultimately evolved into mammals. Obviously, we are mammals. That's a duckbill platypus. And then if you put humans on the time scale, obviously we end up uh, right here on the very tip of the arrow. We haven't been around very long. And you might have noticed that all of those sources of starch that I talk about, that we think about, come from flowering plants. And flowering plants uh, evolved sometime around 120 to 130 million years ago. Mammals had already been around. Mammals would have been sort of fully evolved before flowering plants came and delivered us all of this starch. Starch consumption looked at this viewpoint would be late breaking the species of mammals who would be adapted to consuming starch you would think would be specific to certain lineages of mammalians. In this study, these plates have starch in them and they took saliva from all these different primates. You put a little bit of saliva on the, on the plate and it dissolves the starch around it and you can stain for it. And you can see that humans have the highest levels of salivary amylase, along with baboons, gorillas, rhesus monkeys, and chimpanzees are close behind. Lemures have almost none. And then other animals who also eat grains or dig up roots, things like rodents and pigs, also have salivary amylase. And domestic dogs have salivary amylase, but wolves do not. Wild wolves in the wild being carnivores do not. But there's a catch. Interestingly, algae also make starch. And you can see chlorophyte and rhodophyte starches as factors in diet choice by marine herbivorous fish. These are different species of algae. Here's free glucose, uh, here's starch, protein, lipid, ash. You can see I've highlighted this one in green. Uh, this species of algae in the dry matter, once you if you dry them out, remove the water, they're 10.6% starch, 4.8% protein, 1.4% lipid. That means that if you broke it down by uh, macros, uh, a fish eating this type of thing is getting 60% of its calories as starch, 27% uh, as protein, about 20% of calories as fat. And so if you are something that consumes algae, you might end up consuming quite a bit of starch. And as I mentioned, amphioxus, which has been around about 500 million years, is a filter feeder. It has a little burrow in the sand and shallow water and they, and they come up and they filter feed on whatever's around. And one of those things that's around are algae. And in a lab, you can raise them on a diet of pure algae, essentially. And so Amphioxus, which is 500 million years old, already knows how to consume and use starch. And Amphioxus is our great, 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 great grandmother. And if we put algae onto this timeline, algae is one and a half billion years ago. So algae is ancestral to all of it. And so one has to assume that 500 million years ago, the first chordates, the first 
things with something resembling a spine were already consuming algae and were already getting significant amounts of their calories from starch. Just to confirm that, in 1939, they took these amphioxus, they split the gut open, and they examined little pieces of the gut for amylase activity, and they found amylase activity in the cecum, the proximal intestine, and in the lower intestine. Guess what? Our digestive system evolved from that digestive system that already has the ability to break down starch, and it has for 500 million years that's ancestral. Again, this is an amphioxus. This is their insulin signaling pathway, right? That's an amphioxus. This is in a mouse. Insulin receptor, IRS1, P110A, P85. And this is in skeletal muscle. This is, so amphioxus has skeletal muscle. Starch consumption in the gut and insulin signaling in skeletal muscle has been preserved for 500 million years since amphioxus. <laughs> this ability to uh, digest starch is widespread. Uh, this is in leopards, right? Leopards obviously are carnivores and these guys are veterinarians and they were looking at leopards in zoos. There's a pro big problem with leopards and biodiversity. A lot of them have small populations, limited gene pools. They went to all these zoos and they collected blood from all the leopards that they had and they ran all these analyses on them. They looked at, you know, cholesterol numbers. They looked at liver enzymes. Uh, just to make sure that all the leopards were, were healthy and diverse. And one of the things that they found, one of the things that was very different between different leopards was the amylase enzyme. And they're not talking about salivary amylase here. They're talking about an amylase that's in the bloodstream. So there's multiple copies of the amylase gene. They're not all the ones that are uh, secreted in the saliva. So this is the normal. This is kind of what they would consider normal leopards. This is the level of amylase that you'd see in the wild and uh, of the ones in the zoo, 14 of them were way up here. And so if normal is up to about 400, uh, some of the ones in the zoo are around 2,000. So that's a five-fold increase in salivary amylase. And they don't say why this happened in the zoo. They just say, this is odd. This is something that's out of range. Probably, you know, people are throwing them hot dog buns in the zoo. Like, I don't know what happened. To me, <laughs> this fact that these leopards have massively increased amylase Activity after presumably only a few generations in the zoo. I don't know how old the oldest leopards in captivity are, but probably not more than 200 years for sure. Um, and they also say that this is a heritable trait. So if both parent and offspring results were available, all of the animals for which one or more parents had high amylase results also had high amylase results. So for a carnivore to increase amylase production, all it needs is access to starch for a generation or two. I don't think the question is, is it ancestral to humans? The question is, is it ancestral to chordates? And the answer is yes. Leopards can digest starch because they're chordates. And I threw this in. This is a fun one. Another funny thing about algae. At nighttime, in the dark, especially in low oxygen environments, and I talked in the last video about when amphioxus evolved, oxygen levels in the Earth's atmosphere were much less than they are now. And what happens is under low oxygen, dark conditions, algae make alcohol. The reason that organisms ferment things is that when you do glycolysis, you get this buildup of NADH, and that NADH has to go somewhere. And one of the things you can do is you can ferment pyruvate to alcohol and that gives you NAD plus back. And so the algae during the day, uh, the sunlight is hitting them, they're building up starch. And then at night, the sunlight goes away. They point out in this uh, paper, these organisms regularly face conditions of dark anoxia in their natural habitats. Now oxygen levels low, the sun goes away. You need to produce energy. You have the store of starch. So you start uh, breaking down that starch and you do glycolysis and that gives you ATP to run your cell and it gives you NADH and that NADH you can use to ferment the end product of that glycolysis which is pyruvate into ethanol and that gives you NAD plus back which allows you to continue doing glycolysis and using that starch to produce ATP and so the first chordates would have been consuming these algae which at certain times and certain conditions would be a source of ethanol. And so these early chordates would have been adapted to starch, glucose, fat, protein, ethanol,
And so this question is, how ancestral is starch? And the answer is that starch is deeply ancestral. Starch is 500 million years old, ancestral at least. And I'd be shocked if sponges can't also digest uh, starch because they're also filter feeders. They probably also eat algae. Insulin signaling is deeply conserved at least 500 million years ago back to the first chordates, probably way before that. And these metabolic pathways for starch, sugar, fat, protein, alcohol, they're all baked into the system. And we spend all this time arguing about salivary amylase. I'm not sure that it's an important discussion. I think it's interesting because it perhaps tells us what early humans were doing. Um, there is this question about did accessing these starch resources help build the human brain? I guess that's interesting. But if the question is, what should we eat? Is starch a healthful thing to eat? I believe that it is.